have notes. <laughs> Two. I want to thank the, uh, the organizers of this first, um, and I also want to register a complaint with them. Um, when I asked, what would you like me to talk about, they said, talk about what keeps you up at night. Um, what keeps me up at night usually is dinner. Um, uh, I thought that probably wouldn't be a good topic. Um, so then I thought, well, you know who else keeps me up at night is Julia Child, and she might actually be a good topic, but I can't tell you why she keeps me up at night. So, um, so, um, uh, so, um, and frankly, both of those topics make me really happy, and they were disqualified. Um, so now I'm left with a topic, actually, that, that brings me to tears. Um, I, I want to I talk about um, Joshua DeShaney. Joshua DeShaney uh, was born in 1979 to a very young couple, to a couple uh, known as Melody and Randy DeShaney, who divorced within a year or two years of the marriage, having produced really only tons of tears, tons of fights, uh, physical abuse, and the poor boy Joshua. They got a divorce shortly after Joshua was born. Uh, Melody tried to take care of Joshua, decided that she really wasn't mature enough to do so, and signed over custody of Joshua to her husband, Randy, who had meanwhile moved uh, to Winnebago County in Wisconsin and had remarried. Uh, within two years, uh, by the time Joshua was two and a half or three years old, in other words, uh, Joshua had lived a life that none of us could possibly want. Joshua lived a life um, that, according to figures in 2009, well over 3.3 million children live every year, lives of terrible, horrifying, tragic abuse. Um, Joshua was first admitted in 1982 to a local emergency room brought in by his aunt, where the attending physicians found that he had injuries pretty much on every part of the lower extremity of his body, including his buttocks and his penis, indentations around his genital area, for example, which suggested strongly that he had been hit and attacked repeatedly with uh, combs and other kinds of things. Uh, but perhaps most horrifying um, were the brain-related injuries. Um, Joshua was actually removed from his father's custody for a very short period of time while county authorities did a quick investigation and he was later remanded back to his father's custody along with continued visits over the next two years. And the, to their credit, Winnebago County authorities did continually investigate Joshua and his family living arrangement. They went to the house at least four times over the next two years. Sadly, on two of those occasions, the social worker was told that she couldn't see Joshua once because he was feeling ill, another time because he had the flu. Um, finally, Joshua, as you can probably predict, um, was admitted to the hospital one more time. Uh, the last time he was admitted to the hospital, he was permanently removed from his father's custody, but by then, the extent of the damage was so horrific that Joshua was remanded to um, a state institution where he is now and will be for the rest of his life. Over one half of his brain was simply physically destroyed. He has little, if any, cognitive function to this day. Uh, Melody DeShaney, his mother, um, apparently was unaware of the living conditions of Joshua, but of course found out soon enough, and upon hearing it, decided to sue uh, the state of Wisconsin. Now, she might have sued Randy DeShaney, the husband, but there are good reasons not to bother. Uh, the biggest reason, uh, the most obvious reason not to sue Randy DeShaney is he has no money. There is little that can be accomplished by suing Randy DeShaney other than whatever moral sanction you might get out of it. If you're interested in what happened to Randy, he entered what lawyers know as an Alford plea, which means he did not contest the charges. He was sentenced to a maximum of four years in jail and he served just over two years of prison time. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he hasn't been in trouble since. He did, however, win the Wisconsin State Lottery. Uh, not for a lot of money, but the idea that he would win any money at all strikes me as profoundly unjust in ways I can't even describe. Now, here's why I wanted to talk about Joshua. And I thought about not mentioning him by name, but I thought it was important to put a face on it. Why did I think about not mentioning him by name? Because I'm afraid that much of what I have to say only uses Joshua as a prop. And if you want to say that I, too, have contributed to Joshua's abuse, I think I'm going to take the Alford plea to that, just like Randy did. But nevertheless, here's what I want to say. When Melody sued the state of Wisconsin, she argued that it was the state of Wisconsin at least as much as Randy DeShaney, the father, who was responsible for her child's abuse. Her argument was that the state knew Joshua was at risk from his father, 
And it was her further argument that the state could have and should have done more to protect Joshua from the violence that was perpetrated on him. She made essentially what lawyers would call two different kinds of arguments. And I want to explore one at some length, so I'll get rid of the other one now. The first argument she made is known to lawyers as the positive liberty argument. She argued that the state of Wisconsin had violated Joshua's right to due process of law. And apparently the argument runs something like this. The 14th Amendment says, no state shall deny to any person due process of law. And the argument here was that the state is obligated to protect those who it knows are in danger. And its failure to protect Joshua was a violation of his positive liberty claim to be protected from violence. The state, I'm sorry, the court had absolutely no difficulty in dismissing that argument almost out of hand. It would take us a long way to go down the road, and I haven't got the time or the inclination to do it. Trust me when I tell you that the Supreme Court has never, ever held that Americans have a positive liberty claim to anything, and it is unlikely that it will ever do so in the near future, particularly with this court. Uh, um, that's not really what I want to talk about. Joshua's claim failed for yet another reason, and it's one that I want to spend a little bit of time on here. It's called the state action doctrine. The argument goes back again to the very language of the 14th Amendment, and its key words, its key opening words are, no state shall. And there, according to Chief Justice Rehnquist and a majority of the court, was the biggest impediment to Joshua's lawsuit. The state hadn't harmed Joshua, the argument ran. Private actors had harmed Joshua the private actor being his father. The state action doctrine holds that constitutional rights and liberties may only be violated by state actors. Think state in the grand sense that Richie mentioned it, think of it in the small sense of school teachers, but it has to be a state employee. And the argument here was only Joshua's father had harmed him, the state had nothing to do with it. The state action doctrine has been described by one great scholar as, and here's why I have one of my notes, as a torchless search for a way out of a damp, echoing cave. Which is, I think, a nice way of summarizing the basic point, which is that the state action doctrine is incoherent as a matter of law, but that's not really why I want to challenge it. Think about this for a minute. We could challenge it, right? We could all say, of course the state harmed Joshua. They knew he was in danger. They actually removed him from his father's custody, and they still, in the end, did nothing. We could argue, if we wanted to, that there was state action, and a majority of the court disagreed, a minority of the court, just as Brennan in particular, did agree. Lawyers have these arguments all the time. I have this argument in my constitutional law course all the time. Was there state action? Here's what keeps me up at night. Who the bleep cares if there was state action? I want to propose a constitutional revolution. I want to suggest now that we should junk the state action doctrine altogether. The practical effect of that would be to make the Constitution applicable not only to state actors, but to all private actors as well. And at the risk of taking cheap shots, it would mean, for example, that you have freedom of speech, not only against state governments and city governments, but about private corporations or against private universities. It might be the case, just hypothetically speaking, that some private universities might actually have to allow chalking, not because it would be a good idea, right? <laughs> Do you have a place in mind? Because I, I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, it might be, in other words, that the Constitution's real protections are irrelevant. I mean, I, the government doesn't interfere with my speech. Maybe it interferes with yours, but I've said a lot of nasty, outrageous things over the years, and the government has never shut me down. They've never even tried to shut me down. The government is not routinely in the business of violating my rights. Private power violates my rights. Corporations violate my rights. On a day-to-day -day basis, the Constitution is irrelevant because threats to us come from private parties, just like threats to Joshua came from a private party that the state authorized to act. The most important way to make the Constitution genuinely relevant to making it matter is to make it apply to private action as well as to state action. Thank you.